Welcome back to Deep Learning. So let's continue with our lecture. Today we want to talk a bit about loss functions and optimization. You can build a machine that learns to solve more and more complex problems, a more and more general problem solver, then you basically ha have um, solved all the problems, at least all the solvable problems. I want to look into a couple of more optimization problems. And one of the optimization problems that we've already seen is the perceptron case. You remember that we were minimizing a sum over all of the misclassified samples. Here, we were choosing this because we could somehow get rid of the sine function and only look into the samples that were relevant for misclassification. Also note that here we don't have a 0, 1 category, but a minus 1, 1, because this allows us to multiply with the class label. This then will always result in a negative number in misclassified samples. Then we add this negative sign in the very beginning, such that we always end up with a positive value. The smaller this positive value, the smaller our loss will be. So we seek to minimize this function. We don't have the sign function in this criterion because we found an elegant way to formulate this loss function without it. Now, if it were in, we would run into problems because this would count only the number of misclassifications and we would not differentiate whether it's far away from the decision boundary or close to the decision boundary. We could simply end up with a count. If we look at the gradient, it would essentially vanish everywhere. So it's not an easy optimization problem. We don't know in which direction to go, so we can't find a good optimization. What did we do about this last time? Well, we somehow need to relax this, and there are also ways how to fix this. One way to go ahead is to include the so-called hinge loss. Now with the hinge loss, we can relax this 0, 1 function into something that behaves linearly on a large domain. The idea is that we essentially use a line that hits the x-axis at 1 and the y-axis also at 1. If we do it this way, we can simply rewrite this using the max function. So the hinge loss is then a sum over all the samples that essentially receive 0 if our value is larger than 1. So we have to rewrite the right-hand part to reformulate this a little. Here we take 1 minus y subscript m times y hat. Here you can see that we will have the same constraint. If we have opposite sides of the boundary, this term will be negative. And by design, it will of course be flipped such that we end up having large values for high numbers of misclassifications. We got rid of the problem of having to find the set of misclassifications, capital M. Now we can take the full set of samples by using this max function because everything that will fulfill this constraint will automatically be clamped to zero. So it will not influence this loss function. Thus, it's a very interesting way of formulating the same problem. We have implicitly the situation that we only consider the misclassified samples in this loss function. It can be shown that the hinge loss is a convex approximation of the misclassification loss that we considered earlier. One big thing about this kind of optimization problem is of course the gradient. The loss function here has a kink. Thus, the derivative is not continuous in the point x equals 1. So, there is unclear what the derivative is. And now you could say, OK, I can't compute the derivative of this function, so I'm doomed. Luckily, subgradients save the day. So let's introduce this concept. And in order to do so, we have a look at convex differentiable functions.
On those, we can say that at any point f of x, we can essentially find a lower bound of f of x that is indicated by some x of x0 plus the gradient at f of x0 multiplied with the difference from x to x0. So let's look at a graph to show this concept. If you look at this function here, you can see that I can take any point x0 and compute the gradient, or in this case, it's simply the tangent that is constructed. By doing so, you will see that any point of the tangent will be a lower bound to the entire function. It doesn't matter where I take this point. If I follow the tangent in its direction, I'm always constructing a lower bound. Now, this kind of definition is much more suited for us. So let's expand now on the gradient and go into the direction of subgradients. In subgradients, we define something which keeps this property, but is not necessarily a gradient. So a vector g is a subgradient of a convex function f of x0 if we have the same property. So if we follow the subgradient direction, multiply it with the difference between x and x0, then we always have a lower bound. The nice thing with this is that we essentially can relax the requirement of being able to compute a gradient. There could be multiple of those g's that fulfill this property. So g is not required to be unique. The set of all these subgradients is then called the subdifferential. So the subdifferential is then a set of subgradients that all fulfill this property. If f of x is differentiable at x0, we can simply say that the set containing all subdifferentials is simply the set containing the gradient. Now let's look at a case where this is not true. In this example here, we have the rectified linear unit, which also has exactly the same problem. Again, it's a convex function, which means here at the point where we have the kink, we can find quite a few subgradients. Actually, you see the green line and the red line. Both of them are feasible subgradients and they fulfill this property that they are lower bounds to that respective function. So this means that we can now define a subdifferential and our subdifferential is essentially 1 where we have x0 greater than 0. We have 0 where it's smaller than 0 and we have exactly g and g can now be any number between 0 and 1 at the position x0 equals 0. This is nice because we can now follow essentially the subgradient direction. It's just that the gradient is defined differently in different parts of the curve. In particular, at the kink position, we have the situation where we could have multiple possible solutions. But for our optimization, it's sufficient to just know one of the subgradients. We don't have to compute the entire set. So we can now simply extend our gradient descent algorithm to generalize to subgradients. There are proofs that for convex problems you will still find the global minimum using subgradient theory. So we can now say, well, the functions that we are looking at, they are locally convex. This then allows us to find the local minima even with ReLUs and with the hinge loss. So let's summarize a bit. Subgradients are a generalization of gradients for non-smooth functions. The gradient descent algorithm is replaced by the respective subgradient algorithm for these functions. Still, this allows us to continue essentially how we did before for piecewise continuous functions. You just choose a particular subgradient and you probably don't even notice the difference. The nice thing is that we are not just doing this as an engineering solution, but there is actually a solid mathematical theory that this actually works. Hence, we can use this for our ReLU and our hinge loss. This is mathematically sound and we can go ahead 
and not worry too much. Uh, very, very quickly, maybe even towards the end of this year, but I'd say I'd be shocked if it's not next year at the latest, that um, having the pers having a human intervene will decrease safety. Decrease. Uh, it's, it's like imagine if you're in an elevator. Now, it used to be that there were elevator operators. Um, and and you, you couldn't go in an elevator by yourself and, and work the, the lever to move between floors. Um, and now uh, nobody wants an elevator operator because the automated elevator that stops the floors is much safer than the elevator operator. And in fact, it would be quite dangerous to have someone with a lever that can move the elevator between floors. There's something to what you say in some ways in which I disagree. What if people say, oh, support vector machines, SVMs, are much better than what you are doing because they always achieve the global minimum. So isn't it much better to use the SVM? So let's have a small look at what an SVM actually does. SVMs compute the optimally separating hyperplane. It's also computing some plane that separates two classes with the idea that it wants to maximize the margin between the two sets. So you try to find the plane, or here in this example, the line that produces the maximum margin. The hyperplane, or the decision boundary, is the black line and the dashed lines indicate the margin here. So the SVM tries to find the margin that is maximally large while separating those classes. What is done typically is that you find this minimization problem where W is the normal vector of our hyperplane. We then minimize the magnitude of the normal vector. Note that this normal vector is not scaled, which means that if you increase the magnitude of W, your normal vector gets longer. If you want to compute signed distances from that, you typically divide by the magnitude of the normal vector. So this means that if you increase the length of this normal vector, your distances get smaller. If you want to maximize the distances, you minimize the length of the normal vector. Obviously, you could just collapse it to zero, and then you would have essentially infinite distances. It's over 9,000! Just minimizing W would lead to the trivial solution w equals zero. To prevent this, you put this in a constrained optimization where you require for all observations m, for all your samples, that they are projected onto the correct side of the decision boundary. This is introduced by this constrained minimization here. So you want to have the signed distance multiplied with the true label minus one to be smaller than zero. Now we can expand this also to cases where the two classes are not linearly separable in the so-called soft margin SVM. The trick here is that we introduce a slack variable xi that allows a misclassification. Xi is added towards the distance to the decision boundary. This means that I can take individual points and move them back to the decision boundary if they were incorrectly classified. To limit excessive use of xi, I postulate the xi are smaller or equal to zero. Furthermore, I postulate that the sum over all the xi needs to be minimized as I want to have as few misclassifications as possible. This then leads us to the complete formulation of the soft margin SVM. And if I want to do this in a joint optimization, you convert this to the Lagrangian dual function. In order to do so, you introduce Lagrange multipliers lambda and nu. So you can see that the constraints that we had in the previous slide, they now receive multipliers lambda and nu. Of course, there is an additional new m that is introduced for the individual constraints. Now you can see that this forms a rather complex optimization problem. Still, we have a single Lagrangian function 
that can be thought to be minimized for all w, xi, lambda and nu. So there's a lot of parameters here. We can rearrange it a little bit and pull many of the parameters into one sum. If we drop the support vector interpretation, we can regard the sum as a constant. Because we know that all of the lambdas are larger or equal to zero, it means that everything that will be misclassified or is closer to the decision boundary than one will create a positive loss. If you replace the lambda term with the maximum function, you will get the same result. The optimization will always produce something that will be zero or greater in the case of misclassification or if you are inside the area of the margin. In this trick, we can approximate this by introducing the max function to suppress everything that is below zero, which means on the correct side and outside the margin. Now you can see that we can very elegantly express this as a hinge loss. So you can show that the support vector machine and the hinge loss formulation with those constraints are equivalent up to an overall multiplicative constant as shown in reference one. If people say, oh, you can't do deep learning, take an SVM instead. Well, if you choose the right loss function, you can also incorporate a support vector machine into your deep learning framework. That's actually a quite nice observation. Okay, some open points. Outliers are punished linearly. There's a variant of hinge loss which penalizes the outliers more strongly. You can do that, for example, by introducing squares. So this is a very common choice as seen in reference four. So we can also apply this hinge loss to multi-class problems. And what we are introducing here is simply an additional sum where we then do one versus many. So we are not just classifying towards one class, but we're classifying one versus the rest. This introduces the new classifiers shown here. In the very end, this leads to a multi-class hinge loss. So let's summarize this a little bit. We have seen that we can incorporate SVMs into a neural network. We can do this with the hinge loss, which is a loss function that you can use to put in all kinds of constraints. You can even incorporate forced choice experiments as a loss function. So this then has been called the user loss. So it's a very flexible function that allows you to formulate all kinds of constraint optimization problems in the framework of deep learning. You can put all kinds of constraint optimization also into deep learning frameworks. Also very cool that you learned about subgradients and why we can deal with non-smooth objective functions. So this is also a very useful part. And if you run into a mathematician and they tell you, oh, there's this kink and you can't compute the gradient. So from now on, you say, hey, subgradients save the day. This way, we just need to find one possible gradient and then it still works. This is really nice. Check our references if somebody ever approaches you that ReLUs are not okay in your gradient descent procedure. There are proofs for that. So next time in deep learning, we want to go ahead and look a bit into the optimization. So far, all the optimization programs that we considered, they just had this EDA. And this was somehow doing the same for all variables. Now we've seen that there are many choices for layers and their parameters. Hence, they can be very different and maybe they should not just be treated all equally. Actually, this will lead to big trouble. But if you look into more advanced optimization programs, they have some really cool solutions how to treat the individual weights automatically. So stay tuned and I hope you liked this lecture as well and looking forward to welcoming you in the next one. Thank you very much and bye bye.